because uh, the, the guys are signing in to so I'll check my cameras are away and stuff. Is your beard still working? Yes, yes. Yours is not. On your is yours working? Yeah, no, yeah, working on this side. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you need this thing. Well, I, yeah, I'd love to know. Love to know. My cell phone here is my laptop thing. Yeah. My phone. Hi, buddy. Thank <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, it's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I'm okay. I'm sure we'll be okay. Uh, so we need to open first because these guys need to join in so that we can. We also see it's just for.
Well, it's a very good morning to you wherever you are joining us and uh, tuning in following this uh, live event being brought to you by First Capital Bank. We'll be beginning getting underway at 10 a.m. promptly. That's about 11 minutes from now. And that is the First Capital Agribusiness Value Chain in the Zimbabwe program where we are focusing on key opportunities and how to navigate the challenges. See you in 10. Good morning, good morning. Testing one, two, three, test two, three.
Uh, sorry, good morning, host. Is it possible for us to hear how the audio will sound from our moderator?
Well, hello and welcome everyone who is uh, tuning in and joining us for this webinar across various platforms. We are coming to you live and streaming this on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. This webinar is brought to you by First to Capital Bank. It is looking at the agribusiness value chain in Zimbabwe, focusing on the key opportunities and navigating the challenges. I'd like to welcome all my panelists who are now all ready to rock and roll. I will be introducing them very shortly, but also a big thank you to everyone once again who is tuning in and following us. We encourage you uh, to share as much as you can from here, tag friends, get people to come in and participate in this discussion. It is coming to you on First Capital Bank's LinkedIn page, the Facebook page, as well as the YouTube page. Feel free to tweet, share and comment uh, and tag First Capital Bank so as many people as possible can be part of this discussion. Our panelists today include, and I will begin with our guest of honor, our esteemed guest of honor, and a very big thank you to the Deputy Minister of Lands, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water and Rural Resettlement, Honorable Vangelis Haritatos. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for making time to be here. We are also joined by the Commercial Director for First Capital Bank, uh, Mutema Ushio Kunze. He's a seasoned banker, worked on four different continents, uh, and will be sharing his insights, particularly what the bank has lined up in the agricultural sector. We're also joined by the Secretary General and Head of Secretariat for the Zimbabwe Farmers Union, Mr. Paul Zakaria. He's a very passionate rural development practitioner. We're joined by Kudakwashi Musasiwa. He is a, a man of many hats and many talents, an entrepreneur, a farmer, a software and web developer, a musician as well, believe it or not. He is the co-founder of Fresh In A Box. Uh, great to have you on the panel, Kuda. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we're joined by Tatenda Marume. He is the Export Development Manager for Zimtrade. Obviously, big opportunities for Zimbabwe's agricultural sector uh, to export some of our produce. And I think it will be key to have Zimtrade looking at what opportunities can be unlocked, where those opportunities are, and how we can get Zimbabwean farmers export ready. Just a quick uh, update on uh, you know, the response that we've had to this event. Uh, it has been overwhelming. We want to thank you so much uh, for getting in touch, for confirming your participation, for sending us comments and feedback. First Capital Bank certainly values that, and we take on board every single thing that you have had, you have said. The bank is responsive and will certainly be looking to address the issues that you have raised, particularly some of the topics and areas that you would like to see discussed in future editions of the program. This is just the beginning, let me point out. There will be many other discussions like this going on. And certainly, uh, something I really want to point out from the onset is that the issue of gender balance, the issue of women, uh, participation and empowerment is key is a core value of First Capital Bank and something that is valued there. And certainly going forward, we will see that all discussions, uh, all panels, all engagements uh, have that gender balance and certainly do so across all platforms. The bank is very, very passionate about women's empowerment uh, and certainly looks forward to engaging with as many women as possible, creating opportunities for them and getting them to participate in key sectors of the Zimbabwe economy. Just a quick update of how this program will run. Uh, we will begin by giving a platform to all our panelists to share some insights and some opening remarks. The guest of honor will be the first to kick us off. And then the different players will come in to speak about their specific areas. Certainly uh, the bank will talk about how they are looking to participate and create opportunities for their customers and non-customers to get into the agricultural value chain. Uh, people like Kudam Sasiwa who are rolling up their sleeves, getting their hands dirty in the field, will talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that they have seen, the lessons that they've learned. Zintrade will talk about export opportunities uh, and how we can attract you know, more and generate more foreign currency uh, from agriculture. Mr. Zakaria, I think he's uh, well-versed, seasoned in this industry, and we also have some very important insights to share. After all that, we'd like to encourage as many of you who are watching and following us to send in your questions uh, on the uh, chat uh, opportunities that are created there. You can write in 
uh, your questions we'll be taking written questions only so please um, ask questions send comments and feedback tell us who you are who you are addressing your question to and then we'll uh, ask those questions once all our panelists have had an opportunity to give us some opening remarks so that is the format of today's program we look forward to it being engaging uh, very informative uh, and interactive without taking up much more time I know we want to get into the meat of the matter. Let me now hand over very quickly to our guest of honor, who is none other once again than the Deputy Minister of Lands, Agriculture, Fisheries, Water and Rural Resettlement, Honorable Vangelis Haritatos. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I'm very grateful to be on this platform. Uh, let me start with salutations. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, the Commercial Director of First Capital Bank in Zimbabwe, uh, he's actually a relative of mine, Mutemwa Mukushokunze. It's great to see you, cousin. Um, let me recognize the Export Development Manager of Zim Trade, Mr. Tatenda Marume. Uh, I'd also like to recognize a good brother of mine, Secretary General of the ZFU, Mr. Paul Zagaria. Uh, the co-founder of Fresh in a Box, Mr. Kuda Musasiwa. I hope he's going to give us a few uh, notes today, uh, music notes, I mean. Um, let me recognize any government officials that are on the platform, captains of industry, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's truly an honor really to, to be on this kind of platform. Uh, I think uh, this would never have happened in the first dispensation. This is something that's really come on with the second dispensation where we open up and we really want to tell people out there what we're doing as government. And uh, I'm so excited that uh, First Capital have really taken uh, the bull by its horns, so to speak, and um, in sponsoring this event, because certainly uh, we cannot do anything in government unless we have um, unless we have a great support from the financial sector. And I'm great. Uh, I'm very grateful to First Capital uh, for, for partnering with us on this. Of course, the farmers can, can do it, uh, but we definitely need the support of the financial institutions. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my presentation is a little bit long. I'll try and keep it short because we have a State of, Na a State of Nation uh, address by His Excellency. And uh, unfortunately, I will have to leave you a little bit early today uh, so I can go to Parliament. Uh, so let me just start off uh, just a brief introduction with regards to agriculture in Zimbabwe, as you all know. Uh, it's a common fact that 67% of our population resides in rural communities uh, where agriculture is the major form of economic activity. Agriculture drives the Zimbabwean economy and contributes 15 to 18% of the GDP. It contributes 23% to the total formal employment and provides livelihoods to the majority of our population who live in rural areas. Agricultural value chain employment supports a third of the population with the, se with the sector supplying 63% of industrial raw materials. Uh, it's an ongoing joke that I have with the Minister of Industry that if uh, she doesn't support us as agriculture, then certainly our industry will never thrive in Zimbabwe. So you can see why. Uh, as such, agriculture is a major employer and significant economic actor that drives national growth. It is therefore no surprise that it is central to President Mnangagwa's vision 2030 of attaining an upper middle income status for our country. This year, we are celebrating a bumper harvest of a total of 2.8 million metric tons of maize and 360,000 metric tons of traditional grains. The good harvest means Zimbabwe will save a whopping 300 million US dollars used to import grain last year. This also means that we are on course to achieve the $8.2 billion revenue from, the agriculture, from agriculture by 2025 under the Agriculture and Food Systems Transformation Strategy, which comprises of a multi multiple pronged approach, namely the Agriculture Recovery Plan, the Livestock Recovery and Growth Plan, the Horticulture Recovery and Growth Plan, and the Accelerated Irrigation Development and Rehabilitation Plan. Uh, I'll discuss this more in detail a bit later though. Uh, agriculture's potential is reflected in the projected 34% growth rate for the sector this year, which is a major driver of the 7.8% annual growth rate. Coming back to Vision 2030 and how agriculture is the primary motivator, a middle income agricultural economy has six priority areas and nine targets. Our first area is poverty reduction, uh, we plan on halving uh, the level of poverty in Zimbabwe, food and nutrition security, zero hunger, job creation, 67% um, on farm, 25% uh, formal employment, industrialization, supply of 60% of raw, uh, of industrial raw material requirements, uh, economic transformation, achieve a 6% annual, annual agricultural growth, 
uh, contribute 18% of the GDP, as I mentioned, regional integration, triple regional agricultural trade, and then finally middle income agricultural economy to raise per capita income for farmers from $4,000 uh, to $12,000 United States dollars. Central to achievement of this is the agricultural food systems transformation strategy uh, of our ministry, which I mentioned. Uh, to get more detailed uh, with regards to the agriculture and food systems transformation strategy, uh, we seek to develop a robust agricultural sector capable of turning and steering Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe towards Vision 2030 by providing strategic responses to the increasing population, low agriculture production and productivity, climate change, and low inflow of investment in agriculture. The agriculture and food systems transformation strategy provides a strategic direction for agriculture in line with the SDGs, which I referred to earlier, and the Malabo Declaration. The strategy, the strategy also outlines specific key projects and programs for agricultural recovery and livestock growth, which have potential to create multiple effects in the, in the whole economy along entire value chains. As mentioned, the strategy envisages uh, to create an $8.2 billion agricultural output by 2025. It also targets to increase the contribution of agriculture uh, so as to anchor Zimbabwe's economic growth and growth development in the face of climate change, as well as variabilities. The agricultural food and uh, transformation strategy, I'll just refer to the strategy since it's quite a long name, uh, is supported by the wide range of anchor pillars, which I mentioned earlier, such as agriculture recovery plan, the livestock plan, the horticulture plan, and of course, so key, the Ag accelerated irrigation development and rehabilitation plan. The agriculture recovery plan uh, targets maize, wheat, and soybeans, uh, highlights solid interventions to reverse the negative production trends, attain self-sufficiency and allow the country to move away from perpetual importation of the strategies, uh, of the strategic commodities that I mentioned. Uh, our key touch points, uh, commercial contract farming program led by the financial sector, that's why you are so important. Commodity value chain finance, financial model, uh, that's persuading all private sector players that get raw materials from agriculture to support and produce up to 40% of the requirements locally through contract farming. Uh, promotion of hub and spoke model for smallholder farmers. This is critical, especially in horticulture. It's an unbelievable, simple, straightforward model um, that helps us share resources, but certainly uh, we, we, we get to where we need to, gain, to be. Other strategies are, for example, innovation and modernization, and there are many, many others. With regards to the horticulture uh, recovery and growth plan, there's two major parts to this. There's the presidential horticulture scheme, uh, which will be in the tune of about 186 million United States dollars, almost 187 million. And then, of course, there's a conventional horticulture recovery plan, uh, which is just over 1 billion uh, United States dollars and uh, will be led by the private sector. There's a strong emphasis on value chain financing and investment in climate smart and conservation agriculture, water and irrigation development, mechanization and equipment supply, crop and livestock diversification, including traditional grains, food and small stock. We have also launched within our ministry a policy framework called NAF, as we call it, but it's called the National Agricultural Policy Framework. Uh, so the NAP basically is to stable enabling environment that facilitates flow of investment towards the sustainability, uh, enhancing agricultural production and productivity, which is always a major challenge. Ensuring food and nutrition security and resilience and enhancing the capacity of the agriculture sector to anchor national economic growth and development and upper middle income economy by 2030, as we've mentioned before. The NAP uh, provides an enabling, enabling business environment for investment in, firstly, food and nutrition security, secondly, agriculture credit and finance, thirdly, production and supply of agricultural inputs, fourth, agricultural marketing and trade development, fifth, access to land, land uh, tenure security, and land administration, fifth, agriculture knowledge, technology and innovation systems, sixth, uh, development of agriculture infrastructure, seventh, resilience uh, and sustainable agriculture, and finally, institutional arrangements for effective, effective delivery of investment into the agricultural sector. You can tell that uh, we hardly sleep in our ministry because of all these things. Uh, the challenges in the agricultural sector are many. Um, and, uh, and these, uh, we, are, we are hitting each individual. As well. There is a tremendous amount of work that we've done to address these challenges. Uh, but nonetheless, there are challenges and they need to be spoken about. Uh, we have challenges of low production and productivity. We have climate change and variability, which is a serious, serious challenge. Uh, high cost of, of finance, 
uh, high level of imports, poor marketing infrastructure, and high cost of imports. And I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about each one of them. Low production and productivity, basically agricultural yields for most crops remain very low or quite low. Uh, yields for maize, cotton, sorghum averaged below one uh, metric ton per hectare compared to a potential of 10 tons per hectare, especially for maize. Uh, this has been in the past. Um, we've had a very successful season and uh, that coupled with a new program of Fumbudza has helped us tremendously with our yields. Uh, but nonetheless, yields for wheat and tobacco have been on a decrease uh, since 2000. Although there have been recovery since 2008, the, yields, uh, the yield trends have not matched the trends realized in 2000 and the period before. And this is of major concern to us. So this is a major issue that we're addressing within our ministry and especially uh, of small smallholder, um, um, our smallholders. Uh, low, sorry, forgive me, uh, climate change and variability. Uh, agricultural production in Zimbabwe is predominantly rain fed and uh, vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to the vagaries of uh, adverse weather and climate conditions. These rain fed agricultural systems are expected to be subject to drier and hotter conditions, making rain fed maize production the primary staple a significant challenge. Uh, with increasing climate risks, water is the key limiting factor and, and uh, for agricultural productivity and adaption uh, to climate change. In addition to decreasing rainfall and uh, increased uh, evaporation, annual rainfall, especially in region five, is increasingly variable, characterized by erratic and unpredictable rains. Uh, unfortunately, short, sharp and isolated storms. So we have a mixture of everything. The increasing growth and strength of the climate hazards have significant implications for household food security and income in already vulnerable communities, especially in Southern Zimbabwe. Moving on to high costs of finance, high cost of capital due to country risk, uh, short-term financing uh, at market rates, for example, long-term ventures such as dairy production and plantation agriculture reduces investments in the sectors by potential investors. Uh, in addition, Zimbabwe has high, high interest rates if compared to other countries in the region which makes agricultural finance in the country uncompetitive. This is exacerbated by liquidity challenges faced by the banking sector, uh, which further could, uh, curtails, uh, curtails the agricultural production funding, um, further comprising the competitiveness of the sector. Moving on to our high levels of raw materials inputs, uh, local production of ammonium nitrate or AN from Sable Chemicals, the sole uh, manufacturer has been on a decline with the deficit being met by imports of ammonium nitrate. The bulk of the key inputs such as fertilizers and chemicals are imported and high duty still being levied on imports of raw materials. But I can tell you uh, that um, these, uh, these things should be the thing of the past. We're engaging heavily with the Ministry of Finance uh, so that we can reduce this and make it more affordable. Uh, poor market infrastructure, the under, under development of the agricultural input and output markets has, already, or has always been identified as a stumbling block the achievement of the sector-based objectives, infrastructure and private uh, investment in rural farming areas of on-spot production of key inputs is still lacking. Uh, specialized coal chain facilities and market infrastructure that supports e-marketing of both inputs and outputs are non-existent. The Namalis have benefited more the middlemen, uh, Makoroneros of this world, who then become more knowledgeable and acquire a lot of bargaining power at the expense of the farming communities. We hope that this is gonna be a thing of the past soon. Uh, poor mechanization is another serious challenge. Agricultural mechanization and modernization remains priority to improve production and productivity in agriculture. Out of a total arable area of 4.31 million hectares in Zimbabwe, 1 million hectares uh, are under animal power, half a million hectares under motorized draft power, and the balance of 2.8 million hectares really, really requires farm mechanization. Zimbabwe requires more than 40,000 tractors, 600 combine, combine harvesters, and an assortment of matching implements. Of this requirement, the tractors and combine harvester deficits stand at more than 31,400 units respectively. To address part of these issues or challenges, we have implemented programs with, Belar with Belarusian manufacturers as well as rolled out the John Deere facility. We have several other players who are very keen also to take up the opportunity. Moving on to high costs of inputs. Uh, amongst the selected four countries in the region, Zimbabwe has the highest feed price, followed by Botswana, then Zambia, and then South Africa. So uh, we definitely have to look very seriously into the cost of inputs. Before I get into opportunities, let me make it clear that with any challenge comes a great opportunity, and for the private sector to turn those challenges into opportunities. 
So value chain players, especially financial institutions like Capital Bank, uh, can really play major roles into solving many of the challenges that I've highlighted. So uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, we have a favorable policy environment, which is conducive to private sector investment. Uh, we have the agricultural and food systems transformation strategy and all the other pillars that I mentioned to you early on. Availability of water bodies for irrigation development and climate proof uh, agriculture. Out of the available 33 million hectares of agricultural land, some 6 million hectares are cultivated annually. Uh, Amiga's uh, just 216,000 hectares has been developed for irrigation, constituting only 3.6% of the cult cultivated land each year. Of this, 174,500 hectares is currently uh, usable, constituting 2.9% uh, of cultivated land. The Accelerated Irrigation Rehabilitation Development Plan, such an exciting uh, plan that we have within our ministry, targets a cumulative 400,000 hectares by 2023 uh, from the current 242,000, uh, comprising of rehabilitation of 71,000 hectares, uh, 26,000 hectares smallholder irrigation schemes, and 45,000 hectares A1 and A2 farmers, farms, rather and uh, development of 183,000 hectares of new irrigation. So we are very quickly and rapidly wanting to move away from rain-fed uh, agriculture to climate smart um, um, irrigation. Uh, availability of markets, the coming in of the interim uh, ESA EU economic uh, agreement provides opportunities for duty-free markets access to the EU market, providing a pool to increase local production and increased incomes. Availability of the underutilized processing of, of infrastructure in oil expression, coffee processing, grain milling, and others. The AFC Land Bank will offer opportunities for long term finances, unlike, uh, sorry, unlock great value and also guarantee the bankability of the agricultural land. Our relatively uh, small population means that the excess production can easily be exported to the region and internationally. Since we are not self-sufficient in the production of certain commodities such as wheat, although this season we're coming very close, and dairy, these provide for great opportunities for players to enter into the production value chain. Other opportunities are Zimbabwe has a state-of-the-art coffee mill in Mutare, Chipinge, um, with a combined installed annual processing capacity of 50,000 metric tons per annum. Soya bean is a strategic crop for the edible oils industry and, and for stock feeds, as we know. The country needs about 220,000 metric tons of soya beans annually, and 33% of this goes towards manufacturing of stock feeds. Uh, it's important to note, though, that there is sufficient manufacturing infrastructure in, the, infrastructure in the country to absorb up to 500,000 metric tons of production of soya per annum, of which only 50,000 metric tons is produced locally. The current market is met with imports of oil from South Africa, soya beans and soya cake from Zambia, uh, soya beans from Malawi, as well as uh, South America. Ways of navigating the challenges. The process of enhancing agricultural uh, productivity and production is anchored on sustainable production systems. The NDS-1 focuses on enhancing the resilience of social ecolo ecological systems to be supported by continuous learning and experimentation. For agriculture, learning and experimentation through adaptive and collaborative management, uh, building res resilience is critical and very key. Upscale and expedite irrigation, rehabilitation, and expansion utilizing existing and new water bodies. Uh, you would have seen in a couple of months past that we've launched, uh, well, we've opened through His Excellency, actually, he's opened uh, several dams, which is quite exciting. Uh, climate smart agriculture through adoption of conservation, agriculture techniques, and principles such as from Woodza, which we launched uh, last year and has been very, very successful. Promote water and input use efficient uh, technologies such as precision agriculture. Develop stress tolerant, high yielding crop varieties. Promote traditional grains in low potential areas, uh, which are climate smart. And we've also uh, used this as a design tool within our From Woodza package for this year, uh, where regions that don't uh, typically grow maize or shouldn't grow maize will only receive traditional grains. Uh, implement commercial contract farming that is led by financial services with government providing guarantees, uh, implement a commodity value chain financing model where private sector players are expected to finance up to 40% of, the of their raw material requirements. Implement uh, a climate-proof presidential input support scheme that is anchored on Fumvudza, uh, which the Fumvudza concept, which adopts conservation agriculture technologies or principles such as minimum, minimum soil disturbances and mulching, 
soil fertility management through soil conditioning management practices, including liming and manuring, diversify food production and consumption, moving away from maize to other food crops, such as potatoes and cassava, capacitate extension service delivery, which we've done a great job, uh, thanks to the support we're receiving from the president, speeding up of the mechanization facilities for the importation of agriculture, mechanization equipment, and introduce private sector led production and market initiatives such as the hub and spoke model for smallholder farmers to promote access to finance, um, inputs and output markets, allow women and youth to take their center and rightful role of anchoring agricultural recovery through their involvement. Finally, uh, in conclusion, a very short conclusion, agriculture provides huge opportunities for employment, income generation, as well as poverty eradication. It is the prerequisite of, for the attainment of Vision 2030, as we've referred to on and on again, as the 2021-2022 season beacons, and with indications from the weather experts, the rainfall pattern will be favorable. I urge all of us to, in the agricultural sector to redouble efforts as we once again aim to achieve a bumper harvest this year again. If we jointly uplift the livelihoods of our people, we will certainly take this country to levels far exceeding levels ever attained in the history of this great nation. Thank you very much for listening. I apologize that it was uh, uh, long, but uh, uh, we, uh, we live our, our lives in a very exciting ministry that, uh, uh, that touches everyone's lives in Zimbabwe. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much uh, there to the Honorable Deputy Minister for that very detailed uh, and insightful presentation. As you quite rightly say, you're not sleeping in that ministry, very busy, a full table of things to do there. Uh, and uh, I certainly hope that before you go for the CERN a State of the Nation, you can address some of the questions that have already started coming in uh, that I directed specifically uh, to you. So um, if I can make, because, uh, you know, you've just indicated there that you've got another perhaps uh, 15, 20 minutes with us. If uh, with the indulgence of all the other panelists, if I could just very quickly uh, feel, uh, ask the minister to take about two, three questions that have come through and then we'll move on uh, to the other panelists so they can make their presentations. Uh, very quickly, there is um, you know, a, a participant who has gotten in touch with us uh, and asked a question where we're saying, look, there are all these exciting things happening uh, that we hear on the agricultural front in the value chain. And they are saying, what provision is there for this value chain to be inclusive of Zimbabweans living abroad? And certainly I can vouch for that. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, when I, when I posted this poster that I'll be speaking to uh, people in agriculture and yourself, Deputy Minister, I then had relatives all over the world uh, sending me questions saying, how can we get into agriculture? So I think that's a very pertinent question to, to, to Zimbabwe and support. Is there space for them to participate and get, uh, get on board? Uh, and then another one that has come through, uh, speaking to the issue of finance, which you uh, made reference to. Uh, there is uh, someone who is, uh, Joining us, it is uh, Takuram Tasa, who is asking. You mentioned a very good. You you mentioned a very good thing relating to financing, but what is very discouraging is the borrowing, considering the high interest rates of around forty percent, which is as good as Chimbazo. Um, what is your ministry doing to make it favorable to borrow? So, if you could take those two for now, Honourable Deputy Minister. Uh, and then I'll encourage uh, all other participants who may have questions uh, to quickly send them to us while we still have the minister with us and then we'll move on with the program. Over to you, back to you, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, no, great questions. Um, let me start with the first one. Obviously, uh, you know, with regards to the provision of value chain um, inclusivity, I think um, what I've learned being in government, uh, you know, when, you, when you're on the private sector, you don't really take notice of these things, but when, you, when you're within government, um, the value of our um, diasporans, so to speak, is, is, I don't think you can even put a, a dollar figure on it. It's really uh, the value of them being out there and supporting and continuing to support Zimbabwe is, 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 a, is uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, even if you look at uh, foreign currency uh, retentions and, and uh, money coming into the country, uh, quite a substantial amount of money comes from the diasporans. So I think that. Um, you know, definitely, um, you know, with regards to our ministry, it's probably not the best to answer in terms of financing. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, organizations, financial institutions like First Capital 
uh, I'm pretty sure that they could they could open up something. This is a great opportunity where we can get diasporans involved heavily in, in financing agriculture. Um, and I, I, like I said, I'd rather not answer for on the financing side of that uh, because it's really up to individual um, it's really up to individual banks and financial institutions, which is not within our ministry, how they can take that, how they can get that. Um, uh, with regards to access to markets uh, from that, I think we have an opportunity that if people are abroad that, uh, you know, why not uh, team up with farmers here and help us uh, market our produce wherever they are outside of the world. Um, so I think that's, that's also a great value. Um, basically, you know, Government will always provide an enabling environment in Zimbabwe, and uh, it really takes two parties outside of government to put this together. Uh, government's not really designed uh, for, for me to put someone, let's say, outside of the country to say, um, you know, we, we know Fresh in the Box, Fresh in the box uh, has this opportunity. Why don't you guys team up and this and that? Basically, our, our role would be to, to do some form of introduction and uh, see how that can strive. But I think this question is probably the best uh, answer in the first capital to see how, um, what kind of opportunities that they can provide so that we can get the diaspora money um, into the private sector so that it can, it can definitely support what needs to be done along value chains. Um, moving on to the second one, again, it's a finance, uh, finance question. I was hoping to get other questions really related to agriculture. But what I can tell you is that uh, in our own way, um, um, I think Kormed is a well, uh, uh, I'm sure you were in a meeting this morning where we were talking about uh, productive sector financing. Uh, there is a facility within the Reserve Bank that I'm actually in charge of negotiating, and this is to try and help the productive sector. Um, but, you know, to deal and uh, team up with thousands of farmers is very difficult. So what we've done is we've purposely pushed forward uh, farmers' unions. Um, we've also pushed forward the likes of the private sector that, uh, that are involved in contract farming. Uh, and then, of course, we have our, uh, our colleagues at CBZ Agro Yield. Um, and what we're doing is we're negotiating with, uh, with the government to come up with some form of productive sector uh, reduced financing uh, so that it's directed to the intended beneficiaries. Um, and the intended beneficiaries, in this case, with regards to Ministry of Agriculture, are our farmers. Um, so uh, I agree with you as a private individual in Zimbabwe, our, our borrowing rates are too high. Uh, but I, what I can tell you is that, um, you know, as the economy stabilizes, which has done a tremendous uh, thing in the last few months, if not a good year now, um, you know, as, as, as long as inflation reduces, uh, cost of borrowing certainly will reduce. Um, the country risk is a major fact, a fact I'm sure Kwame uh, Dushokunze will also tell you that. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's not something that can be done overnight, but there's certain things that have to be done so that we lead towards that where automatically, uh, as a private individual and citizen, you can go and approach uh, a bank and get a, a relatively good loan. Uh, you know, not a short-term loan, but something a bit long-term. So the, the other answer to this is that that's why we have the AFC on board. Uh, AFC has four pillars, uh, two of which will, will answer this, uh, the AFC commercial aspect, which is your agri bank, uh, also getting a lot of support so that they can lend on to, to farmers. And then, of course, the, what I mentioned in, in my presentation was the AFC Land Bank, which unlocks a great amount of value from, from land. So uh, my hopes are that all of this will come, um, you know, where, where we've probably had challenges or other banks have had challenges in the past um, uh, is that the recoveries have not been well, have not been good. So what we need to do is encourage our farmers to pay the debts. Uh, you know, you take loans from government, you take loan not government, but you take loans for, let's say, from uh, command agriculture, you take loans from commercial banks, and then uh, you hear these banks saying, you know, your farmers are not paying us. And uh, this needs to stop. I think it's now 2021, we can't keep uh, uh, saying that this is a hand down, this is not a grant from government. We have to be serious. If we're gonna be in farming, we've got to take the bull by the horns and we've got to, it's a business, you know, it's nowhere else in the world uh, can people just be getting something for free. And, uh, you know, we, we have very vulnerable people we need to assist them as much as we can as government. But now if you're an A2 or a commercial farmer, you've got 500 hectares, uh, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't at all be having a discussion about why you cannot pay a loan back. At that stage, you're in serious business. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that have to be put in place, uh, but what I can tell you 
is that, uh, um, as I mentioned before, we're not sleeping. And uh, we, uh, we've got a very good uh, relationship with Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank. We meet twice a week uh, to discuss these certain issues. Again, they, they, they affect us. They're not our issues, but they affect us and therefore they become our issues. So I can tell you that a lot of exciting things are, are happening in the pipeline. And I think a lot of the issues that, that I raised as part of the, um, as part of the, the, the issues regarding agriculture in Zimbabwe, I think very soon and quite rapidly, I believe um, that uh, th these will be addressed. So uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't answer everything as, as much as possible, but uh, I think that financial institutions uh, definitely have to take advantage of uh, our diasporans. And I think that uh, they can be a better person to answer that one question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Minister. Just a couple of more questions. Uh, one specifically from me, and uh, I'll abuse my position as a director of ceremonies. And I, I heard you in your speech, uh, well, in your presentation, speaking about the low productivity and yield, which I think continue to be a concern. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I heard you specifically uh, how that is being addressed. Is this, um, does this point to perhaps that uh, services like Agritech perhaps are overstretched or there isn't uh, adequate skills there. So how is that issue of your low yield, particularly amongst uh, smallholder farmers going to be addressed? What's the plan for that? And then we have uh, another participant, uh, Masimba Makasa, Makasi, who is asking, um, Honorable Deputy Minister mentioned a deficit in terms of equipment. Apart from bilateral agreements with countries such as Belarus and suppliers from there, what room is there for private suppliers to also come on board uh, and participate in those sort of arrangements? Thank you very, thank you very much for the, for the two excellent questions and uh, thanks for abusing your power there. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, look, low productivity and, and um, uh, yield is, is the, my first uh, issue that I put on my presentation um, because we, we, we work with three Ps in our ministry and that's uh, production, productivity and profitability. And um, if you can't get your production to be efficient and your productivity in place, forget about the third P. You know, all of us want to make money uh, so that we can be profitable. Uh, but if you're not productive uh, productive, and you're not efficient, you're not going to get there. So what, uh, what we're doing is it's a multiple pronged approach. But um, to summarize the entire approach, we are climate smarting in our agriculture. And uh, climate smarting means irrigation development. So uh, traditionally, we've always had rain fed uh, agriculture. And the, the dangers of rain fed agriculture, as we see in the last few years with climate change, is that uh, reduced rainfall or even in some stage, stages like we've had some cyclones where we have too much rainfall. Uh, crops require a certain amount uh, of, of water. And unfortunately, um, it's always a plus minus, but it can't be 100% up and 100% down. So, uh, you know, if, if it's too much rainfall, it's also very bad for our crops. If it's not enough, uh, it's also not good. So what we're doing is we're trying to uh, climate uh, smart our agriculture. And, uh, and this comes with many different ways. Um, uh, you know, one is the seed, as I mentioned in, in my presentation. Uh, we've got climate smart seed, uh, which are pest uh, um, and disease resistant, which is great for our climate. Uh, the second one is, like I mentioned, uh, irrigation development, which moves our farmers away from uh, from uh, rain fed agriculture. Um, there are several other uh, things we've, we've also implemented from Vudza, which is uh, amazing. Uh, you know, we um, we went around the country, the three ministers, the two deputy ministers and the minister. And I'll be honest with you, there was a, there was a lot of, uh, within our circles, a lot of people laughing at us and saying, oh, you guys, and so on and so forth. But uh, you know what? After the season, guess what? We got a 5.5 metric ton per hectare uh, output from, from those Makombas that people <laughs> were laughing at. You know, so that, uh, the Fumvudza thing, uh, it's an amazing, straightforward uh, water harvesting, mulching, um, it's a straightforward uh, program that, that has been really, really, uh, um, really, really uh, efficient and uh, successful. Uh, we are expecting about a million tons uh, production from, from Vudza this, this past season. So um, these are the kind of uh, things that we put in place. Um, also, the, the mechanization is also part and parcel of this uh, because we need to make sure our farmers are efficient um, and um, they come in, they plant in time, they harvest in time to minimize post-harvest last losses. Uh, so it's quite a quite a quite a uh, quite a mouthful of uh, of different ways that we are addressing productivity and and yield issues. 
And even to add on to that is financing, uh, because that also affects, uh, you know, it can affect your time, it can affect your, your, um, um, uh, your efficiency as a, as a farmer. And moving on to the last question uh, with regards to the deficit of, of equipment, certainly uh, the organizations that we're dealing with, the uh, Belarusian uh, company, it's a private company. Uh, John Deere is also a private company. So there's, there's nothing to it. You know, if, if you are a private supplier and uh, you want to put a presentation to ministry, please uh, feel free. We are not uh, selecting. We, what we want is we want quality. We don't want to be, we don't have Zimbabwe as a dumping ground to bring in poor quality tractors and, and uh, combines. So definitely there is a stringent measures that we've put in place that we, that we will check equipment before they become, uh, uh, before they pass and before uh, we, we are supplying farmers with that equipment. But uh, certainly we are open to, uh, to any form of uh, presentations and feel free to approach our uh, Department of Mechanization, which is geared up for these kinds of proposals. Uh, again, it, uh, it's a major deficit that we have, but if you're a supplier, it's a great opportunity. If I was, uh, if I was case today, I would be, uh, I'd be smiling at the opportunity that I have because if I can, if I can supply even 10,000 tractors of the 33,000 tractors that we require, uh, that'll mean that I hold a third of the, of the market share uh, just by that supply. So uh, to me, if uh, I'm a businessman, but uh, I wear two hats, I wouldn't, obviously I have a conflict of interest. I would never get involved with that. But if I was the owner of Case and, uh, and other suppliers, oh, the sky's the limit. Zimbabwe is definitely, you will not grow your, your, your organization as much as you can in Zimbabwe. Every else, everywhere else uh, you cannot sell uh, 33,000 tractors. There's no other country in the world that'll, that needs 33,000 tractors. So it's a great opportunity. So please come, come forward and, and uh, definitely apply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister. One final one here before, I know you need to go very shortly, but I think this is one that many people who are uh, following us here will have. It is coming from uh, Jonah Chireka. Uh, and he's asking, as for some, uh, some of us, we have our capital start production, access to equipment as well as markets for sale, but it is difficult to access land if you don't know anyone. I have tried several times to apply without success. What are the plans in place to so that we can also access land? Thanks very much. Yeah, this is this is the next question. I thought I would I would have uh, uh, as one um, you know, obviously, uh, land is a resource, uh, more land available, because obviously, should you feel that you are a farmer, um, there are certain areas that we're downsizing, um, that we know that land will become available. But I also want to, to raise a red flag and warn you that the waiting list is quite substantial. There's, it's not 1,000, it's not 2,000. We're talking of almost 300,000 people on the waiting list. So uh, what we need to do is we need to try and look at what we have for now and see how we can get around this. And uh, one of the, the easiest and fastest option is a joint venture with someone that does have uh, a piece of land. Um, you know, I think that's something that can be done and negotiated fairly quickly. Uh, on our side as ministry, we're coming down quite hard on, on people that are not being, not utilizing their land. But, um, you know, this is an ongoing process. You have to follow uh, our law and our law has certain um, uh, things that we, we need to do. And uh, it's not as easy as just, you know, pitching up at someone's house and saying, um, Tim, I'm sorry, you're not using your, your farm, so I'm giving it to this such and such person. So you, you have to understand that uh, land reform has passed and uh, most of the land, 99% of the land was issued to, to beneficiaries. And uh, so now we're looking at increasing the production from the land that's being held under, for agricultural purposes. And so, like I said, apply. Uh, but you need to be as patient as you can, please, because obviously uh, there are these 300 odd thousand uh, applicants that have already applied before you. And so what we're saying is that it's not to say that uh, it's not a possibility. It definitely can. Uh, you can definitely still become a beneficiary of, of land in Zimbabwe. But uh, this is an ongoing process. Right now we are implementing the first round um, of the land audit, which uh, touched on 16,000 farms. And we have followed to the, the comma and to the full stop, word for word, exactly what the Zimbabwe Lands Commission has told us to do. So definitely there are some farms that will be allocated uh, 
but uh, you know you need to bear with us uh, as a businessman not being the deputy minister of lands uh, i would definitely tell you don't don't wait let's look for people that are willing to to come on board that uh, that we can partner with and let's let's get our joint ventures let's get our farming uh, done and let's get productive again even if that means that you have to partner with someone that does have an offer letter thank you uh, thank you so much, Honourable Deputy Minister. Let me now hand over to uh, other members of the panel. Uh, I would like to begin with the Commercial Director of First Capital Bank because I think quite a lot of the issues uh, to do with finance, with uh, funding, have come up from questions, but also in the Minister's uh, presentation. So uh, it's over to you, Mutema uh, Oshokunze, to tell us, uh, I think, to respond to some of those issues, but also uh, unpack what First Capital Bank has in store in terms of uh, making sure that people can participate in this value chain. Thank you very, very much, Farai. Um, first, uh, please allow me to uh, thank the uh, Honorable um, Harry Tortas for his, uh, his presentation and his comments. Um, uh, I think the audience will, will find that some of his responses were, were very candid, um, um, which, which we truly appreciate. Also to welcome the uh, other members um, of the, uh, the panel. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us in this. Uh, uh, it's a first um, of many uh, conversations that we will have about uh, the Zimbabwean opportunity um, and uh, you know the, the role that finance plays in it uh, in terms of how we see it here at first at First Capital Bank. Um, I, I think you know I, I always have this tendency to to speak to, the things that I am seeing, right? As, as the commercial director here, um, I manage corporate banking, business banking, SME banking, um, and the investment bank. And um, my, my role has taken me to, let's call it three corners of the country. I think the, uh, the only place I haven't been to yet is, is, uh, is the sugar world uh, in the Southeast. Um, and, and what I've seen uh, is, is super encouraging. Uh, when, when it comes to um, agricultural development. And, and it's, it's a point in time analysis where my reference is from, you know, 20 years ago, where our economy went through a bit of a wobble. Um, and, uh, and we seem to have come out of that. We still have issues like, like any, other, uh, any other place in the world, but, but there is progress that is taking place. And that progress... Um, uh, critically requires, you know, all the players to be active. Um, and I think from the minister's comments, uh, it's certainly clear that, that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture um, and the executive itself have a, have a strong plan in terms of trying to turn things around, uh, especially in a sustainable way, which is a, a, a very big buzzword, uh, uh, especially when you're operating in, the, in our financial circles. Um, but across the commercial, medium scale, small scale, as well as value add, uh, there is a lot of investment uh, taking place. Um, and, uh, and, and critically, you know, what we've discovered uh, from, from our own observations and analysis is that uh, uh, funding is required. Uh, but the, the challenge with, uh, with uh, Zimbabwe's you know, at times our financial institutions, especially our, I'll call it our private sector financial institutions, uh, that don't necessarily have, uh, you know, a state, a partial or full state mandate. Um, we follow um, a number of criteria in terms of being able to to uh, avail funding, um, and over and above that, you know, we can we can talk six ways about high interest rates and and so on and so forth. But, but critically, we all need to be thinking about solutions. Um, here at the bank, um, you know, we uh, provide CapEx finance, working capital finance, um, uh, asset finance, cash flow management solutions. Um, uh, this year, we, we launched our first uh, collateral management uh, structure where, you know, importantly, you have uh, contractors, you have farmers, you have off takers, and you put all these entities within an agreement uh, that ensures that, you know, the bank, uh, the, the money that's availed by the bank gets paid, uh, the concerns around uh, security are alleviated, the crops are insured. Um, uh, and it's, it's, these are not new things, but, but the, the, you know, we've identified that 
if the agricultural sector is to grow, then um, financial institutions like ourselves need to be active in terms of uh, delivering on, on said solutions. Um, importantly, though, as we move down the value chain, um, you know, down to the small scale farmer, uh, something really important was mentioned about, uh, about JVs. I think JVs could operate uh, or could present a very powerful uh, uh, narrative towards the financial sector in terms of increased participation, uh, um, especially if it's a JV where you take, you know, those that are experienced with those that are trying to start up. The the the, the progression the progression of that would be critical, but most importantly, you can then have a. Uh, uh, you know, a robust conversation with the financial institution, um, uh, which can then, you know, avail, avail that funding. And we're, we're open to such, uh, and you'd be quite surprised to, to realize that in, in terms of information, you know, we probably uh, sit on a database that, that uh, would tell you where, you know, your most profitable farmers are, where there is uh, access, et cetera, et cetera. And, 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 you know, you put that all in a box um, and I think you you know you can develop some some interesting funding solutions that that gets us over uh, not just the food security line but but importantly uh, generating export revenues um, and ensuring that our shelves are full with Zimbabwean-made products. You know, so um, you, you know this in our sense uh, we we are you know taking it uh, uh, by the horns. Um, we we believe that we are not short of uh, of agricultural expertise, uh, which can get us over the line. But critically, what we've come to understand is all the institutions involved need to work together. So we're talking about um, you know the markets, the universities, uh, the growers, the contractors, the merchants. Um, um, we all need to work together in terms of trying to provide solutions to get product out of the ground, to get it processed. Um, um, uh, and to uh, to ensure that value is is uh, is is attained um, uh, from the entire exercise. So I'll, I'll leave it there for I. Great, uh, thank you so much, Mutema, um, for that uh, uh, presentation and obviously speaking to some of the issues that have been raised there. Certainly, I think that the message is that the door is open, and we hope that uh, as many people as possible can come through and have conversations with you. Uh, we're going to move on to, to other panelists, but again, a couple of specific questions that have come through for the minister, which we, uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that he's still here with us, so we can have some of these answered uh, very quickly before we move on to our next presentation, which will be uh, by Mr. Zakaria from ZFU. Uh, but we've got Mulani uh, uh, Mude, who is asking, Deputy Minister, talking about value chains. In agriculture, there seems to be an increase in mushroom farming and consumption in urban areas. How is your ministry uh, doing to promote mushroom farming in peri-urban and rural communities? Thanks very much for the question. I'm going to take just this one and then I have to rush to Parliament. Um, look, mushroom farming is, is very specific. Um, I think if, if I can answer it more, a more broad uh, based uh, because Last year was the first of its kind that we actually launched from Vodza in urban areas. And uh, part of the from Vodza is there's, there's also the horticulture aspect to it, uh, the small scale support. So we have quite, quite an exciting thing happening right now, with, uh, the launch of the horticulture recovery plan, um, which uh, will have 10, um, 10 trees given to each household in Zimbabwe, um, all over the country. And uh, these trees are, are region specific, some can be citrus, some can be other, um, other horticultural produce that's required. Um, you know, if, if it is something to do with, uh, with mushrooms, I think the, the best thing is let's, let's, uh, let's look at the value chain. Let's take the value chain approach. Uh, individual farmers are more than welcome to, to do whatever they feel that, that that's right. Uh, we won't have a pur purposeful sh shift in policy for that uh, specifically. But uh, if this individual could, uh, could maybe get in touch with the agritex officer so that they can understand if they are part of the one of the, the beneficiaries that we've identified around the country. And I, I certainly hope that, uh, that they are. Um, going back to the value chain approach, uh, I'd just like to encourage farmers that, um, you know, anything you do with farming, take it backwards. Um, look at what the market requires and grow what the market requires. Uh, if everyone, I'll just use the example of mushrooms. If everyone in one area grows mushrooms, uh, you know, it's a supply and demand issue. 
you end up having too many mushrooms at a time uh, and then it drops the price and then someone comes to you and says, ah, money, there's no money in agriculture, blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, maybe you've just uh, negatively affected the market by oversupplying a certain uh, product. So uh, I think, you know, what we're trying to do, and that, that's why the hub and spoke approach is really quite important for us because it taps into also the marketing uh, side of it. We are also partnering with the uh, Ministry of SMEs, uh, uh, Small and Medium uh, Enterprises, that's uh, uh, women, uh, Women's Ministry, as well as Ministry of Youth, uh, so that we can also develop these things because we feel that markets uh, are you know, very, very important. We're also looking at e-platforms, um, which can, can also support um, um, our farmers so that they are growing in time, they're growing the right product that's demanded at the right time so that they can get the best price. Uh, we're tired of seeing the macro of this world being supported. I think we need to support our farmers and we need to support those that marketed at uh, designated markets. We don't need someone in between that. Uh, what that means is that the consumer is the end loser, the farmer is the end loser because the consumer has to artificially buy a more expensive product. Uh, the farmer doesn't get enough for his produce. If, once you kill the macro once you kill the middle, the middle man uh, in between, all of a sudden the farmer gets more, uh, gets more money but then the consumer also has to pay less for the produce. So uh, it's a win-win. It's a negative inflationary uh, for, the, for the economy. And I see my brother Kudade is, is shaking his head. He's, I mean, he's, uh, he's in agreement because that's exactly what he's doing. And that's what we want to encourage. So uh, I'm sorry, colleagues, I, I have to run. Uh, but thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a true honor to be on this platform with uh, some great names. And, uh, and thank you so much to First Capital. Please keep it up. And uh, we, we, we hope that we get invited to more and more of these things. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the Honorable Deputy Minister for, for responding to some of those questions and obviously being part of this. We want to move the discussion on very quickly. Uh, before we get to Mr. Zakaria, I've got a question coming through to uh, you, Mutema, and it is um, a question from Rimbai Natalie Tarazia. She's asking, do you fund, at First Capital Bank, do you fund companies that have not been trading but wish to access working capital or cap for CapEx? For example, a company incorporated in 2019 that has been registering, uh, putting together all its paperwork and opening bank accounts and is now ready to tap into agriculture. Is there collateral needed, especially for such companies um, as is visually required since they, and they do not have any assets or do you consider structured facilities? Uh, thanks, thanks for that question, uh, Wimbai. Uh, we, we would certainly look at um, uh, look at the proposal. Um, it, it would uh, definitely be around uh, structure. Um, it uh, it would speak to it would need to speak to what you want to do. Um, uh, you know the, the question around uh, security uh, critically it, it it needs to be answered from what you are trying to trade, what you are trying to sell, and how you are trying to trade it. So I would encourage you to, to come see us um, and, and we can look at your, your proposal. Um, you know, track record is always a thing, um, but if there is value in the proposition, then, you know, uh, it's, it's something that we could potentially take further. So we would have to analyze it on its merits, uh, but, but definitely I would encourage you guys to, uh, to, to come in and have a chat with our guys here. Thank you so much for that. Let me now hand over to Mr. Paul Zakaria from the Bible Farmers Union. Obviously, you have been in the trenches for many, many years. Uh, a lot of optimism right now around Zimbabwe and agriculture. Perhaps you could speak to, you know, uh, you know, how do we build on this uh, dividends? How do we launch from this platform and also share your insight in terms of some of the key lessons learned and how we can perhaps make the, the policy environment better to be able to, to maximize this value chain? Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, moderator uh, Farai. Um, my submission will be also very short, but um, I will focus exactly like you, you, you have directed, um, but more on the opportunities for, for agribusiness. Um, the, the environment is actually very conducive for us to look into how we can build on what we already have uh, in terms of talking, in terms of complaining, in terms of crumbling, that's the work that Zimbabwe Farmers Union does, any other union anyway. So you get to a point uh, sometimes when you say, no, we have uh, said enough. 
let us look at uh, what we can do out of what we have said. And I'm sure this is exactly how uh, many Zimbabweans feel, uh, be it in the country or outside the country. There is this uh, question, what should we do? How can we contribute? How can we make things better? And I'm sure it is within our means and it is within our reach. The policy environment exactly has to be sorted out so that uh, we begin to see uh, that dividend, uh, as you put it. And uh, clearly, within the ministry, like the uh, deputy minister shared earlier, within the Ministry of um, Lands and Agriculture, we are seeing, uh, you know, that positive change. As a farmers organization, for many, many years, we struggled to open doors within this ministry, and it being a parent ministry anyway for agriculture. But for the very first time in many, many years, uh, the nature of consultation has increased and our role in terms of influencing policy and uh, building also on the uh, uh, few uh, things that we can in order to make the operating environment more conducive, these are beginning to kick in. So we, have, we, we participate in many working groups and we meet monthly with the minister to discuss some of these challenges and uh, we have been making some inroads. Now, to the issues uh, that I thought I would share with you, when it, it is, it, it, there is no doubt whatsoever that uh, Zimbabwe presents a huge opportunity in as far as uh, agriculture and agricultural growth is concerned. So when we compare the agricultural growth rate and the overall GB, GDP growth, uh, over years, I actually went back to, you know, as far back as 1970, and I was going picking and tabulating uh, the two uh, agricultural growth and overall uh, GDP growth. And I saw that the two, uh, in, they, they do agree in terms of their movements, where you do not have in a year where the agriculture, where agriculture uh, does not uh, perform, you will see that also the GDP drops. And uh, this normally around the uh, moderate to severe drought periods. And also, yes, during the land reform era, there was a huge drop because of the disturbances that were seen there, uh, which have now since been rectified or corrected one way or another, land is now in, in, in the hands of uh, uh, the, the majority. And from about 2008, 2009, the growth just shifted and it jumped and it almost uh, matched the pre-independence uh, uh, um, levels. And then of course the droughts that have uh, occurred in between the 2010, the 2012, 2013, 2016 droughts. So the GDP has also been tracking the same. But however, this has to be seen in the context of uh, climate change uh, that the deputy minister spoke about, but quickly, Climate change also presents some serious, serious opportunities for us because we are not going to you know, reverse climate change overnight. There are so many things that are affecting climate change. The Annex One countries, they are looking more at industry. They are looking more at you know, mining operations, very big, huge operations. And the, at the COP uh, platforms, agriculture is normally not a very, a very serious uh, issue. And it's only once I think uh, two years back when it was uh, presented as an agenda on their item, many countries then are just followers and they are just listening and they are just takers. But now the opportunities that I'm seeing in here is because the changes that are, are happening in terms of the uh, climate and, 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 and variation, uh, is, uh, we will see that uh, disaster risk management, you know, in terms of insurance, this is an opportunity that we need to explore. And in this, sadly, we see that our insurance companies, they have actually not uh, innovated enough 
to, uh, to mitigate some of the risks that our farmers are uh, experiences, experiencing, particularly the smallholder farmers. And uh, we therefore need appropriate insurance products for the different categories of farmers and very innovative customer, uh, you know, designed, customized to meet the actual needs of the farmers. Look at the climate resilient variety development and agronomy research. These are areas that we really feel they present huge opportunities. Whoever wants to invest out there, there here are the opportunities coming actually from the felt needs of the farmers. So agribusiness can actually provide an enabling environment in terms of technology for GIS, uh, for land management, agro uh, weather services, market information, livestock traceability, you know, it is sad to see that animals can get lost in Zimbabwe, and then you find a whole a law enforcement organization bringing people to a, a to, to a paddock somewhere and to say, "Can you identify your animal?" It clearly means that there is a huge gap there. Then, in terms of research and extension, the public extension service, which is Agritex has about 1,900 extension workers to serve the countries approximately 2 million looking at smallholder farmers only here, uh, which is an average of about uh, a ratio of one extension worker for every 1,053 farmers. So what are the opportunities there? We need development of applications for ICT-based extension. And I'm sure within the ministry, they are already looking at it. It will, take, it will take quite some time, but this is where public, you know, sorry, private sector should kick in to say there are gaps in terms of extension. How can we plug up these gaps and create businesses out of that? Farm management digital solutions, uh, you know, this bundle of solutions to, you know, a farmer can actually go onto their, onto their phone, you know, on the click of a button, they should be able to buy uh, inputs, they should be able to see the weather information, location specific and so on. Remote sensing also for, for, for soil, crop and livestock monitoring. These are critical issues. The issue of mechanization that the minister spoke to uh, in Zimbabwe, animal draft power is used in preparation of about 70 to 90% of the cropped area. Tractor power for about between 2% to 15%. And your hand hole, that is the tillage by hand, for it caters for about 5 to 15%. And what are the opportunities there? Tractors and tractor equipment, be it in importing or even manufacturing or assembling such you know, equipment locally. For crop protection equipment, manufacture and distribution, that's a yet another opportunity. The development of appropriate technologies for smallholder farmers, you know, we're talking about Fumvuza right now. The Fumvuza, if you go where they are doing land preparation, they're actually using the hole. The, the and this is where you have the popular uh, statement, it is speaking to the drudgery you know, associated with uh, uh, conservation farming, particularly in the smallholder uh, areas. So opportunities exist in this for appropriate technology development and also bring conservation agriculture from Vudza to the large scale commercial farming operations where with appropriate technology, over a thousand hectares can actually be prepared with this law, uh, soil till, till methodology, which can actually bring more in terms of yield, in terms of uh, soil, soil and water conservation, and also in terms of uh, cutting back on costs. So storage and marketing is yet another for farm structures. In Zimbabwe, post-harvest grain losses are estimated at 20 to 30% in storage alone and can be as high as 40% when including field transportation, handling and processing losses. There are possible you know, solutions which are, you know, which come in the form of opportunities here for agribusiness to take advantage of. There has to be research and development in grain storage technologies. We see this year with the bumper harvest, 
already our grain marketing board is strained in terms of uh, uh, storage. So we need more investment. These are business opportunities. Whoever has money can actually move in and uh, uh, research, develop, and implement some of these projects in terms of storage technologies. Then there is investment in cold chain infrastructure for perishable produce. Just two weeks ago, we saw for, uh, at Mbari, there were tons and tons of tomatoes that were being thrown away because uh, they were no longer good for the market. Uh, the life shelf had passed. And that is a sad story when it comes to the farmer because the farmer has used money uh, to produce and they get to the market Time does not allow them to sell, you know, uh, within a re reasonable space, and they lose their 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 crop. But they can't also take it back. They can't also take it back home because it costs money to take that back home. So they just dump them by the roadside. But a lot can be done in terms of uh, lengthening the shelf life and also developing uh, that cold chain. So this is yet another business opportunity. And appropriate technologies for farm level grading, cleaning and packaging, this is critical. And it requires also investment, people to come in there. Now I'll mention two last commodities, just two commodities that I will mention, because I mean, it's very, we have many other commodities that we can talk about in terms of their value chains. Cotton, the contribution of lint to total sector exports is very high at 83% over the period 2005 to 2013. Here you are talking of uh, uh, over 75,000 tons per year of cotton lint on average for the last 25 years, reflecting an insufficient local transformation. Instead of selling our cotton, our lint in its raw form, there are serious opportunities for our gineries or our ginning companies to feed local, you know, spinning, weaving, and many other value chain uh, players so that we add value. We don't export US dollars, we don't export jobs, we create these jobs locally. There is need to tweak that area in terms of uh, policy and uh, see if it is true by policy that these companies are mandated only to sell uh, via export, uh, they, are, they, are, they are linked. And uh, then we, we, we follow the genes, we follow the sheds from the export from, uh, as imports. And that it clearly does not make any business sense. Zimbabwe could save a lot of money by developing uh, industries that can you know, take a responsibility and produce a lot that we can use locally and then export out of the excess. So it is just one, I'm just rushing because of time. So farmers can derive more value also from their seed cotton produce through value addition if we reconfigure, that is, if we reconfigure the cotton uh, production financing mechanisms such that there is a lot of free cotton out there, farmers can actually uh, uh, put more money in their pockets. So it offers an opportunity also for our business to develop and supply appropriate technologies, including small mobile gineries, handlooms, you know, small textile startups, oil expression and stock feed mix uh, equipment. Then the, the other commodity is tobacco. There is, there's been a lot that has been said about tobacco, the value chain. Um, I'm happy that there is a plan already, the Zimbabwe Tobacco Value Chain Transformation Plan, which is aiming at increasing tobacco value addition and beneficiation from the current 1% to 30% to generate about 5 billion US dollars by 2025. And this is, I will say, and I'll repeat, within reach because we have the tobacco. And the other part of it is increasing tobacco production and productivity to 300 million kilograms uh, annually. So the opportunities that exist in the contract farming opportunities, of course, but the contract farming must be localized so that you know, our farmers are not contracted by you know, offshore contractors who want the leaf so that we export the leaf in its raw form. 
And yet you can imagine how many cigarettes can be uh, manufactured out of just one leaf. And then investing in tobacco processing and then input supplies and services and so on. And when you look at financial inclusion, Finscope survey of 2014 is estimates that at, uh, as at uh, 2014, 23 percent of Zimbabwe's adult population was financially excluded. And according to Finscope's uh, survey, the majority, which is 58 percent of adult Zimbabweans, do not borrow. Not that they don't want to borrow, but then 45% indicated that they do not have that ability to borrow. And this speaks to the issues of collateral and various other things. But now, what are the opportunities? Tailor-made banking products. We need to look at the farmer who is now on the ground. Last year, the, the, the terrain is different. And we now have a totally new you know, farmer on the, on the farm. So we need to look at what their needs are within their time space, understand them as much as they also should understand what is, what is required by the banking and financial institutions. Then investing, we need also to invest in warehouse receipt systems and associated services. And these, the receipts themselves can then be security as well. But we need more of this. The ZMX has come on board, but we need, there is room for more players in that field. And then contract farming arrangements, value chain financing, and many other things. So in the interest of time, uh, let me leave it at this for now. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Paul Zagaria, for that. I think it's some very, very important uh, opportunity that he highlighted there. Uh, and I think uh, you know, the call is for, for innovation, for, for, for thinking outside the box and differently from how we've done in the past. Let me very quickly hand over to Tatenda Marume, the export manager for ZimTrain, because again, in all of this, we know that you know, there is huge potential to export some of our produce abroad, as we are already doing. Uh, but uh, I think uh, Mr. Marume will have more information on what else over time. Um, thanks, uh, Farai, and uh, thanks to First Capital team um, uh, for creating this uh, platform uh, to allow us to discuss what I believe is a very uh, important uh, issue at, uh, at this point. Uh, allow me to acknowledge uh, the other panelists as well. Um, Honorable Deputy Minister in absentia, uh, Commercial Director, uh, Mr. Usha Wokunze, uh, Mr. Paul Zagaria, Serefiu, and uh, Kudam Sasiwa, um, fresh in a box. I think uh, what's quite encouraging is when you see uh, policy, uh, finance, and the farmers, as well as the agro entrepreneurs speaking the same language, then it means indeed uh, Zimbabwe's agricultural uh, sector is um, on the rise. So for those that may not be in the know, uh, ZimTrade is the national trade body of Zimbabwe. Uh, our role is to assist um, you know, local companies uh, as well as uh, individuals to access uh, export markets. So we are there for you. We are there to assist you uh, to grow your, your, your export business. But uh, before I get into the details of my uh, presentation, um, let me just uh, highlight uh, just a, 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 a one issue uh, and emphasize what I believe is um, quite um, important. Um, you know, a farmer, just like a transporter, just like a banker, or just like a manufacturer is also a business person. And uh, we know that the best business people are the ones that react uh, in a viable way uh, to changes in the environment. They realize and follow the trends, you know, and sometimes they anticipate the trends uh, so that they can um, adopt their businesses. And as we speak, there are quite a number of issues that are of effect, uh, you know, to the export uh, sector. Uh, first and, for and foremost, I think the global population is expected to reach about 10 billion uh, by 2050 which is uh, you know, quite encouraging for those that are into agriculture because it means more mouths are to feed. And as you know, the earth is not increasing in size. So farmland is not going to increase uh, significantly. Simple economics will tell you that um, there will be pressure on uh, food systems and the value of our food products will even grow much more. So for those that are sitting on the fence, thinking about whether they want to get into horticulture or agriculture in particular, this is um, the right okay we seem to have 
lost Tatenda very briefly there as uh, he works on returning his signal. Let me quickly now move on to Kudamsa Siwa. I think all of this. Oh, Tatenda, are you back? Right. Uh, I think I'm big now. Uh, there was a slight uh, issue here. Um, the other trend that I want to talk about, that I want to highlight, uh, is, uh, you know, the changes in terms of uh, the lifestyles, uh, especially in terms of uh, our uh, dietary habits. Uh, this has been happening over, you know, the past uh, six, seven years, but I think COVID-19 has sort of accentuated uh, these changes. There is a move uh, you know, towards health and well-being. And, um, you know, uh, if you look at what's happening in the world, I think before COVID, the world was talking about superfoods. Uh, but after COVID, the world is actually crying um, uh, for, 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 for superfoods because everyone is looking for any beneficial nutrient that they are going to get um, um, out, out, out there. So if you want to get into horticulture, it is better that you consider also looking at these superfoods because you get uh, premiums out of them and the demand is actually very high. Superfoods are those uh, products that are considered, uh, you know, to be very high in nutrients, uh, you know, above the normal ones. And um, they could be products of animal health or products of uh, a plant, so, uh, of, an of animals or products of um, uh, plants. And, um, you know, just to give a few examples, like blueberries, uh, which are very high in antioxidants, um, just to also highlight citrus, uh, high in vitamin C, you know, everyone was just looking for oranges and lemons during the, um, the pandemic. And uh, as a country, we couldn't even supply any more because all the uh, produce that we had um, was committed. In fact, all the, the produce that we have, even the, the future plantings also, are committed uh, for the next uh, few years. So you can see the level of demand uh, that is coming because of uh, these changes in, um, in lifestyle. So if you look at it still in line with uh, the issue of uh, health and well-being, uh, people are also moving into organic, uh, organic food. You know, um, I think the world is becoming more discerning about what they, uh, what they consume. Even locally, you have individuals that will tell you that all the food that they consume is supposed to be uh, organic. What I just need to highlight is that it is not organic unless it is uh, organically certified. But uh, there is, you know, a benefit to the certification because normally with organic, you get to end at least 30% more in terms of um, uh, the premiums if we compare it to the um, to the conventional uh, uh, to the conventional products. So there are a lot of opportunities there as well uh, for the for the export market. And uh, in terms of uh, convenience, uh, because remember I said you are, in, you are in business. So you are not just going to farm something that you can farm and try to sell uh, to, the, to the market, but rather you start from the market first and come back. And like any other business, co consider the needs of your, of your clients. So if you look at the European market, most of these people are going to work and they leave uh, their homes very early in the morning, come back later in the day, they might not have even time to cut their vegetables. So why not invest in high care centers and do value addition, cut the vegetables on their behalf, pack and, 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 and supply like that. Uh, normally what happens is when you do that, the value of your products uh, increases three times, three times, and it opens up a lot of opportunities as well. I was talking to one farmer who was sharing their example to say, um, you know, carrots can be grown in the United Kingdom. So it is very difficult to export carrots into the, United, into the United Kingdom. But because they were doing mixed vegetables, they then put some carrots in there and included other vegetables that cannot be produced in the United Kingdom. And guess what? The first year they exported 11 tons worth of, um, worth of, 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 of carrots. So these are some of the opportunities that people uh, need uh, to, 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 to consider there is need to, for us to actually work on convenience and making it easier you know, for our, uh, for, 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 for our, uh, our clients. Even so, if you look at it uh, now, because of the changes in the dietary habits as well, you, cons you, you look at what, how people are consuming. Where myself, I would buy uh, you know, some um, fast food. Others are eating what we call veggie snacks, you know, picking some specially picked uh, uh, vegetables and fruits, mixing them, and then that's what they eat for um, uh, for lunch. 
So we need to consider that it's not just a game of getting into the field and uh, growing what we can um, grow. And what we also need to consider is that there are also changes in the market. I think um, it's, 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 it's sort of uh, you know, uh, basic or elementary knowledge that when you get into business, go where the money is first, and then also consider where the growth is. So traditionally, our market is the EU market for, for, for fresh produce, uh, taking almost 70% of what we produce here. The money is still there. It's a market that is still worth uh, considering. But do not focus on the EU market only. Because if you look at what's happening, especially in the Middle East, with the changes in terms of opulence uh, and, and their consu consumption uh, habits, they've become multicultural um, um, societies. And even their habits are now more inclined to the Eurocentric and, and, and American-centric um, uh, consumptions as well in terms of their imports for, for fresh produce. And the growth is phenomenal. Uh, whereas in Europe, uh, the market is about 97 uh, billion. Uh, the GCC community is 7.5 billion, but it is uh, growing. Countries like um, UAE are offering you know, opportunities. Um, and the good thing about uh, the UAE market is that their requirements are not as stringent as those that are um, for, the European, uh, for the European market. So you get clients that will not even ask you for some uh, of the certifications like um, a global gap. But even if we are to come closer um, yeah. to home, the... Sorry, Jacinda, if I could just come in there. I want to the... allow the panelists to finish them. Yes. Because there are some questions that are, are coming to specific to what you are speaking about now. Um, so if I could just allow Kudam uh, to come in for five minutes, and then we can take as many questions as possible. Yeah. I know okay. you want to touch on more of the opportunities. I think many people want to, uh, to get into that as well. So if I could just quickly uh, ask Kudam to come in now, and then we'll take some of the questions once we finish with him. No, that's 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 fine, Farai. Well, thanks very much. Uh, Kuda, over to you. Uh, I think obviously speaking to uh, someone who has uh, seen the opportunity, come in and acted on it. What are some of the lessons, key lessons, and do you think opportunities going forward? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mwakutuya, for, for moderating us. Um, uh, thank you very much to uh, Honorable Hayototas for, for joining us, uh, and, and I know he had to leave. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mutemu and your team for setting this up. I'm really uh, encouraged to see a big finance industry like yourself uh, engaging um, in, in this kind of discussion. It's very important. Um, you know, I, I'm very, it was really cool listening to Mr. Zakaria pretty much give a lot of what I was going to say uh, away, which, which is great, because then I can really summarize what I was going to say about uh, latching on to uh, opportunities. And, and also, Mr. Marumi, obviously, talking about the vast amounts of opportunities that have now been created uh, in this new world uh, that we're living in. You know, as fresh in a box, um, as uh, you know, you know, I had a serious bout of COVID uh, be beginning of this year where I almost died from it. However, as a business, I have to actually say that, you know, we benefited a lot. Uh, from, from, uh, from, 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 from when the people were shut down and could not access uh, shops and services and farmers could not get to market. Uh, a company like ours really stepped into the middle of that and really benefited as a company because of this new great innovations that have happened in the world, including uh, you know, technology, which has given us the ability to access billions of people uh, in one go. So it was easy to connect our farming, a grower community, um, uh, with, with, our, uh, with the, getting them their produce directly to people's homes um, and also to some of our bigger retailer um, uh, customers. Uh, we could coordinate all of that with technology very, very easily. So it was a big uh, plus for us as a generation to have some of these great technologies um, which can make us do things that our, our, our fathers and forefathers could not even dream of. Um, you know, uh, some of the reasons why a lot of our growers in our grower scheme at Fresh in a Box have fallen over uh, are very simple reasons. You know, a great broccoli farmer falls over because Anosha had $300 yembe or, or can't afford inputs um, because of maybe, you know, a, a simple problem that they had. And I think I, I was hoping to get out of this and what I have got out of this is that there is now opportunities um, to engage um, in, in institutions like First Capital so that we can get some of our growers to, to be able to stay within the value chain, stay, stay growing great food. 
um, on, on that area for companies like ours. Because financing for the agriculture has become one of the biggest problems uh, in, in Zimbabwe, obviously because of bankability and because of you know collateral and some of the other things that smallholder farmers fail to get. Um, for I, I'm happy to hand over to you now. We can deal with questions so that I don't have to repeat a lot of the things that were said by the other esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you so much, Kuda, for that. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, I would like to take as much uh, uh, you know, feedback, as many comments as we can from people who are following and participating in this discussion on the various platforms. As mentioned, we are streaming this on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on YouTube. A couple of comments and contributions coming through. Uh, Desire Nemashakwe says, um, the Honorable Deputy Minister, as well as Mr. Zakaria, highlighted the issue of climate change. How efficient and effective are our weather stations to be able to support weather index-based insurance? Is there room for private sector investment in automated weather stations? Uh, I'll allow you to answer that very quickly, Mr. Zakaria, but before you do, we also have Doreen Chimwara, who is uh, she's the country coordinator for USADF. She says, um, uh, we are working with upcoming community-based enterprises involved in agriculture production and marketing. They do not have assets for collateral. There are challenges in accessing affordable long-term finance to assist with agricultural inputs for their membership as well as for crop purchases. Does First Capital Bank look at these groups? Are there other alternative ways within the bank to assist the market? Thank you so much. I think that one will be directed to Mutema. Uh, but, um, you know, I also want to let you know if you are you know, participating in this discussion, the presentations that were made, uh, for instance, uh, we know that uh, Mr. Zakari had a presentation, Mr. Marume had a presentation. We also look forward to sharing those with you so you can uh, get more detail from them uh, at your own leisure. Uh, but over to you, Mr. I'll begin with you, Mr. Zakaria, and then uh, Mutema, and then we'll take a few more questions from the rest of the panel. Well, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, in as far as uh, with the Med Department being accurate and all that, I think they are better placed to, to comment on that. Um, my take to the question around uh, the importance of weather information um, is, is, is that uh, there are now many platforms that are providing uh, weather information um, within our own the ZFU you know, bundle of solutions, which speaks to weather information, market information, and various other social uh, services. We rely on a license that we have from uh, a, a private uh, organization, international organization, aware that gives us uh, location specific weather. And uh, then, of, of course, one can go to the broader you know, platforms, AccuWeather, and so on. Um, in addition, of course, to our very own Met, Met, Met department. So I want to believe that there is room, and yet it is another opportunity, um, either to harvest the information that is available and package that information, and then through an application, provide that information. And I'm sure there is no law that uh, prohibits any a serious investor who wants to invest in that direction to do so. So it is lastly, it is very, very important actually to know exactly when you're going to have your rains, whether you're going to have you know, frost, uh, hailstones and, or, and things like that. For a farmer, it is very important because many farmers this past season lost quite substantial you know, amounts of uh, uh, volumes of their produce to the vagaries of the weather, which if they had just been informed, they would have avoided such, uh, such losses. In the winter, uh, many of our farmers during winter, many of our farmers lost uh, produce due to, to the frost and so on. So I want to believe that there is room and uh, it is yet another opportunity for anyone to invest. Thank you very much, Farai. <laughs> Doreen's question um, with regards to uh, community-based enterprises, you know, you know, it's a great question that you've asked, Doreen. Um, the, the fantastic thing about our ecosystem here is, uh, you know, we get to see uh, all the players um, uh, and we get to understand what the players specifically are doing. 
um, you know, for a community program in the context that you've asked your question, uh, crops are required, um, uh, levels of mechanization are required, uh, and, and critically to get all those things over the line, uh, finance is required. Um, and our commitment here at First Capital Bank is uh, importantly to, to entertain uh, such opportunities and such conversations and to connect, uh, critically to connect um, uh, organizations such as yourselves or communities that you represent with, with those that are within our ecosystem that can facilitate. Um, and on the back of, on, on the back of that, uh, critically to, to provide uh, the necessary financing to get your activities um, uh, off the ground. You know, it's, as I had mentioned before, it's really important to ensure that, um, you know, you, you, you know what market you want to play in, uh, you know, you know the value of that market. Uh, and then we can work backwards to understand, okay, so who can get you a fertilizer? Who can do your seeds? Where do we bring the expertise from to ensure that the, the process runs as effective as possible? How do we protect ourselves in terms of insurance? Um, and then on the back of all of that, we provide uh, we provide funding, uh, and 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 critically, what what it what uh, uh, our strategy does is it allows you to formalize and then to, to crystallize the um, uh, the opportunity. I, I thought I would just add that you know we are you know entertaining a number of uh, other organizations, external organizations. Just just last week we had um, an envoy from the uh, Irish Embassy in Pretoria uh, who came to make presentations. Um, um, uh, with the help of uh, private sector uh, uh, in Ireland. Uh, specifically, you know, we spoke to uh, individuals that have partnered with um, uh, Zimbabwean companies, Zimbabwean farmers, and are sharing knowledge, um, uh, which, which has seen a material improvement in the yields of the products that they are uh, that they are producing, but but there is a, a massive opportunity for knowledge transfer that the bank is wish, is, is is wishing to express with the with the uh, Zimbabwean agricultural sector, Zimbabwean uh, agricultural market, um, and it's something that, uh, that we look to share with all of you, and we look forward to presenting in uh, in due course. Thank you so much uh, for that, Matema. Um, a couple of more questions. Uh, I'll you know, I'm going to uh, ask these questions first of all to you, Tatenda in terms of uh, you know, those export developments, you've obviously spoken about uh, emerging opportunities, the UAE, for instance, which may not be as stringent as other markets like the EU. Uh, how best do you think, um, you know, what assistance is available? How do you support players that want to go into that space? What recommendations may you have for someone who uh, is wanting to export into those markets? Where do they get that market intelligence? I think that will be very important. Uh, could that to you, I think, um, Earlier, I think it's Mr. Zakaria who made mention of tomatoes that had to be, you know, thrown away because there was just a, uh, the, the market was flooded. As someone who is uh, working in this particular space of fresh produce, uh, you know, how do we manage things better? How do we plan better? So a lot of farmers don't end up doing this. I, you know, I've noticed, for instance, there are a lot of people who are growing onions right now. A lot of people grew uh, sweet potatoes last year as well. So how do we, how do, you know, people who, want to make money in this, manage it better so they don't end up getting their fingers burnt uh, by growing things that everyone else is growing. Uh, how do we plan around that better? Uh, to you, Mr. Zakaria, there is a, a, a Colin Mutema who got in touch with us uh, on LinkedIn who's saying the Department of Research and Specialist Services is not adequately funded. For example, the coffee research station in Chipinge does not have adequate tools and equipment to carry out the work, their work properly. I ended up donating an electron microscope to them the other time. You know, what is the plan? So to you, Mr. Zagaria, obviously, uh, research and development is crucial as we go forward to come up with climate proof uh, and climate resistant uh, variants or you know, variations of, of, of seed and stuff like that. Uh, is that being done adequately? Are there opportunities perhaps to partner with agencies or organizations that could assist us to invest uh, in appropriate research and development? Uh, I'll begin with uh, Tatenda. Thanks, Farai. Um, as Zimtred, we are there to walk the journey with uh, the farmers. As you rightly pointed, the first thing is to get the market intelligence and the market information. What are the requirements? Uh, what are the products that are in demand? We offer that. And uh, when you have the information and you have made a decision now to get into exports, the next thing is to build your capacity. 
uh, because sometimes desire only is not enough. You also need to build your capacity. We are also there to work with uh, local farmers in terms of uh, uh, building their capacity. We have engaged different partners uh, like uh, PUM, which Mr. Zagaria also represents here. They have senior experts that we can then also uh, deploy to assist um, at the, the farmers. We also have compliance programs that we run, especially for those that are in groups. Um, the small scale farmers that can be grouped together, we can assist them in terms of the certifications. And um, when they are ready and the product is there, then we also work uh, in terms of uh, uh, the export promotion. This is now where we are working with them, the final mile in terms of exposing or developing those linkages with um, the potential buyers. So we attend international exhibitions like Fruit Logistica in, in, in Berlin, Germany. We also do uh, buyer missions where we bring in buyers. Like uh, for instance, uh, we actually have a buyer in the country right now from uh, UAE. Um, and um, we then expose our, 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 our farmers that have got capacity uh, to those buyers. We also do seller missions. Uh, we have done uh, seller missions in, uh, in, in Dubai. We have done in DRC as well. Uh, just to make sure that our our farmers are linked to the markets. And we also then offer a cross-cutting service, um, which Mr. Zakaria highlighted that, you know, when it comes to complaining and crying about issues, we are also there, you know, to add our voice uh, to assist exporters when they face uh, challenges, be it on a macro scale or be it on an individual basis. Maybe they have issues at the border, maybe they have issues with one of the facilitators, be it Zimra, Arabizet, and... Uh, you know, the other organizations. So I think in a nutshell, that is the journey that we are willing to, to work with uh, our exporters to make sure that they also, you know, are part of the export community. Uda, uh, if you could respond. Yes, um, so the, the problem with, um, the, the problem we are all facing, and I was in Joburg a few weeks ago, and I, I found that they are also facing the same issue is that, um, offtake of our produce coming out of our farm sometimes is not is is, is not managing to to, to take everything uh, away from farmers so we have a lot of situations where um we are growing some of the wrong crops at the wrong time um you know we tend to all grow cabbages around the same time because of ease of growth and then when it gets a bit warmer we all go tomatoes etc and this is a, it's, a, it's a problem that we haven't even managed to, uh, to crack okay eh? uh, it's it's something that as farmers we're going to have to get together and do better in our communication, do better in our, our value addition to some of these products. I mean, throwing away tomatoes is unacceptable. There should be ways of tinning, canning, making pasta sauces, et cetera, et cetera, uh, along the value chain to make, um, uh, to, to, to preserve uh, a lot of these crops. And I think this is, these are some of the things that we are so searching ourselves every single day. Uh, we had about, you know, 3,000 kgs of potatoes that, uh, you know, in post harvest loss, and that just got that that just uh, you know died. And I think these are some of the things that we're all searching as farmers, and we're really open to to, to suggestions and to to other people joining the value chain. See how can we, you know, when we have loads more tomatoes than we need or that we can sell, who can we pass it on to so they can make sauces, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, so that we can uh, you know get some value for the crops that we grow. Because a lot of us, including myself here in Green Forest. We are throwing away too much food uh, because sometimes you don't have great cold chain, sometimes you don't have great value addition uh, process afterwards. And also uh, our main disposal uh, of our produce for most, most Zimbabweans who don't have fresh in a box retail type outlets is that we have to take our produce to Mbare. Mbare is controlled by many middlemen, Makoronira, et cetera, like the minister was saying. And, and basically, the farmer is always going to lose um, in, the, in the current setup. So there is a lot of work on the farming side of things. Now, uh, with the help of other experts within the industry, to see how can we get to a stage where we stop wasting food? And, uh, and, and because it's not about growing too much. I mean, we, we are not growing enough to even feed the people in Zimbabwe because there's still a lot of food insecurity in, in Zimbabwe. However, we're gonna to have to find a way of preserving and keeping this produce uh, for longer. Great, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Zakaria. Well, thank you very much, moderator. Um, the question that I think I heard is about uh, the Department of Research and Specialist Services uh, not being adequately funded. And uh, that uh, the, 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 the question came from someone who actually then donated to 
uh, the Chipinge research station out there. It, it, that is so true. And uh, the DRNDSS uh, invited the Zimbabwe Farmers Union to their uh, strategy review earlier in the week in Victoria Falls. And I was there and uh, this uh, the issue was actually presented and it took quite some time uh, you know, with uh, participants deliberating on it. And the head of the DRNSS actually acknowledging that some of their equipment is obsolete and um, some of the systems would need to be revamped. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that, they, all, they actually have very useful information which needs to be packaged and then sent out to, to the farmers. And one of the critical things that was actually touched on was um, the, the difference between research and extension, where these are two separate um, uh, but related uh, departments within the same ministry. Um, the, the research would have to uh, do what they do in terms of science, researching on varieties and many other things. And then in terms of extension, passing on their research findings to the extension. And we, we agreed that uh, yeah, in that process, quite a number of things can actually be lost. And uh, there is need to really integrate the two. But uh, back to the issues of adequacy in terms of funding, the, the, the meeting actually was open to partnerships with the private sector to invest uh, within the scope of DRNSS and also to mention that uh, outside DRNSS in the same function, there is room for private sector players to you know, uh, put in their, their efforts and uh, we, we can increase uh, access to research and development within the country. It used to happen back in the years before, uh, uh, before prior to, to 2000, uh, um, to the year 2000, we had many uh, private re, re, you know, research organizations uh, you know, playing their part. And the CFU members actually used to rely on the private researchers and private extension. That's why earlier on, I spoke about these as opportunities for agribusiness. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zakaria. Questions coming through thick and fast and contributions. John Chireka is getting in touch with us via LinkedIn. And he's saying what we need to do is to find out how farmers can add value to their produce, such as repackaging, for instance, tomatoes, tin, tinning them and, uh, you know, packaging them, turning them into, uh, into uh, uh, purees and things like that, which we've, you know, we've heard uh, quite a bit about this. Uh, but certainly when I have engaged with other players and, and other stakeholders, uh, they also speak to the fact that, uh, you know, it may not be sustainable. I mean, two weeks ago, yes, tomatoes were being thrown away. But if you set up a canning and tinning plant, you need 52 weeks of, of that, you know, of supply and product. And so perhaps they may not be, uh, it may not be sustainable in terms of that. And I'll throw that to the panel to discuss and, and share their insights. Uh, a couple of questions coming through here. Uh, to you, uh, Mr. Mtemo Sheokun, the question is that, um, are there agricultural specialists that can give farmers strategic advice? Uh, and so perhaps here, uh, you know, I'm not, putting myself in the shoes of the person who's asked this, I may not understand the numbers. All I know is that I've got a piece of land. I know there's demand for a certain product. I'm willing to work hard and put in the work. Uh, can the bank assist me by partnering me with a, a, a specialist who can then give me strategic advice and help me in terms of to ensure, to ensure that I'm able to, to meet my obligations and pay back that money? That is to you. I want to ask uh, Kuda one more question. You know, we've heard quite a lot about technology, ICT, and how that can be deployed in, 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 in agriculture. Certainly you are using it from an e-commerce perspective and things like that. Uh, how accessible is it? How realistic is it for some of these farmers, particularly the small scale ones, to make use of ICT, uh, to, to monitor weather, to plan and, you know, how accessible is it? Is, is it that easy? Or is it very easy to, to put on paper and say, you know, ICT works? How applicable is it in our Zimbabwe scenario? Is the data affordable, for instance? Is there knowledge and awareness? Is there enough infrastructure around it to be able for a small scale farmer in Chihota, for instance, to use their ICT, to use their phone, to actually make money or enhance how much 
to get out of their produce. Those are some of the questions I have for now. I'll begin with you, Matema. Uh, thanks, Roy. Yeah, so so we run a, a uh, an agricultural team that's uh, based out uh, in uh, in Mount Pleasant, uh, just off uh, uh, secondary Second Street, Second Street Extension. Um, um, our our ag team are not just bankers; they are uh, uh, agriculturalists as well. Um, um, so, so they'd be more than willing to, uh, to, to help profile your, your project, uh, and to help, uh, work through your business plan. Um, as we get closer to 2022, we're looking at, uh, developing information sessions that will be running out of, uh, out of our Mount Pleasant branch, uh, for farmers, um, or, or, or budding farmers, um, as a way of uh, introducing them to, to crops, crop management, uh, and then critically uh, uh, managing uh, the business plan in and of itself with respect to, to finances. But over and above that, our ecosystem, uh, as wide as it is, uh, gives us access to a, a depth of skills and, and, uh, and expertise, uh, which, which uh, we are more than happy to, uh, to share with you. Great, thanks, Kuda. Yeah, so your question is a great question, Farai. And, and I think the answer genuinely, your answer question was, is ICT available to all Zimbabwean in Zimbabwe the value chain? And the answer is no. Um, you know, we, we, we don't yet, yet nearly have enough people connected uh, and we, 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 considering the price of data, considering the, the, the coverage that we currently have, uh, the considering the price of alternative um, uh, internet connections like VSAT, which are very, very expensive and currently unattainable for most of us as farmers. So uh, it's another conversation that we're going to have to have uh, with, you know, with our Minister of Agriculture to see how can uh, this, new, this new technological space be far more inclusive, be more affordable, because it's a powerful tool. Um, as, we, as, we, as we get into spaces where agronomists don't have to come physically, but we've got the Internet of Things and we've got the ability to diagnose crops online, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of potential for being more, far more uh, efficient and effective in, in, in our agricultural practices if more people have access to the information that's available. Uh, there are great innovations out there that are coming up. I know the team at Farm Hut have developed a great WhatsApp uh, SMS bot platform which farmers could interact with. But again, it's not as elegant as an app or as, an, uh, or, or, or as a website, but they are trying to find workarounds and find ways uh, within Dumeni, et cetera, to see how we can communicate with people who are on normal feature phones, which are not smartphones. Uh, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And look, it's, it's a brave new world that we're going into. There's a lot of opportunities within that space of improving communications. I know there's things like Starlink, which are about to go, go online, which will give uh, cheaper ac accessibility to the internet, but we have a long way to go. And um, I hope we'll be at the forefront of championing, uh, talking to our ISPs to see how we can make it more affordable for farmers to be online or on farmer platforms. Mr. Zagaria, if I could just ask you to also come in on, on this question I just asked, because we know we've seen in the past, you know, sort of ICT services facilities that have been introduced for farmers. Have those actually gained traction? And if not, why not? What is the challenge when, when it's been taken out to those thousands of, of your membership? Well, thank you very much, uh, Farai. Um, like um, uh, Kuda has just said, you see, when we engage on these virtual platforms, there's always this uh, the assumption that you know our Zimbabwe is connected, you know, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, you know, and we can do WhatsApp. I think there is need for us to do some research in terms of um, the coverage, who is connected. And that question is very critical. Sometimes we 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 we, we fool ourselves to think that uh, because I'm on Twitter, therefore everybody's on Twitter. And uh, the, the the apps that we are talking about. Um, that farmers should access, should access. It does not translate to farmers are accessing uh, that information. Number one is about the 
platforms, eh, the gadgets themselves, do they have the smartphones, eh, smartphones that are required for them to be able to access that information? And for the greater part of our, our society, no, they don't have the smartphones that we are talking about. When you go out there, you will actually see that the Kambuzi, at least the one who has the Kambuzi phone, is the king in that area. They are, they are, they, they can be, they can be reached, you know, at least, you know, the concept of if you are, if you are a blind man amongst the, uh, if you are, if you are one eyed amongst the blind people, you know, you, you are king. That's the kind of, you know, even Zizora Jero, Wani Roro Chero, Kanarine Shanga, you are still king in that area. So we still have a long way to go in that. So number two, it's also the data, you know, when you talk about the data bundles, and I'm happy. Um, Sasiwa just mentioned that many people actually do not know that uh, our service providers are actually making a killing because uh, when they when we use the WhatsApp, the, the data and so on, in Zimbabwe, you compare ourselves with uh, countries elsewhere within the region, not going too far. You will see that uh, we are actually being... Um, you know, drained in as far as the cost of data is concerned. So the same data will cost per unit, will cost the same value to the farmer who is out in the rural areas, who is struggling to be paid by Kotko, struggling to be paid by GMD and many other things. And besides the fact that most of these commodities are not profitable at the moment. So the access is very, very uh, difficult. So we have had to rely on, you know, we have, you know, contact persons uh, in the communities who have the gadgets, who we, we, we finance in terms of uh, data bundles, and then they relay the information to the farmers, but then look at the uh, time uh, you know, uh, aspect of it. It's no longer real time. The market has already gone by the time the farmer hears about uh, there was a market and it was only three days ago, that market is gone. So there are serious concerns and I'm only confirming here that uh, our farmers have not uh, utilized these apps as much as they should do. And I also give um, uh, the same example with the farm hat. We have a, a relationship, a business relationship, a partnership with farm hat as Zimbabwe Farmers Union. And uh, yes, because it is not uh, relying that much on uh, the, 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 the smart, you know, smartphone, uh, the phone platforms, and it is not also requiring so much in terms of data. Our farmers sometimes struggle, but they get some information, but are they all getting it? The answer is no. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, we are uh, very privileged to have uh, from the uh, Ministry uh, of Agriculture, we have an official who has been part of the, you know, the discussions here. His name is Freeman Buta and uh, he's the Deputy Director uh, with Strategic Policy, Planning and Business Development in the Ministry. He responded to some of the questions that were raised earlier. I'll just quickly, uh, you know, give you some of the responses he has given us. The one around mushroom production that was asked earlier, he said that the ministry in collaboration with the private sector is set to roll out a mushroom production program, which is capitalizing on what is known as Chunkao technology. The objective is capacity building for commercial farmers for commercial production of edible and medicinal mushrooms. Uh, he then also then responds to say, in terms of what is being articulated uh, by Mr. Zakaria, I think this was around issues of insurance, the ministry is working with various stakeholders uh, and has appraised that it is set to pilot and evaluate impact of impact of a customized area yield index crop insurance product. This will be piloted for the climate proofed presidential input scheme from Budza uh, beneficiaries this year. The scalability of the area yield index crop insurance uh, will be based on the results of the upcoming pilot exercise. So. Uh, some of those issues that were raised are certainly uh, being addressed and coming through uh, from the ministry. Um, as we head towards wrapping up, because we're almost out of time, I think I'll, uh, you know, hand over this time to Tema um, Shurokunza to just uh, give us some concluding remarks. And I suppose, again, a recommitment that, uh, unlike what we've seen in the past, First Capital is here to, to understand your unique circumstances, to understand and be innovative around agriculture because I think one of the key issues that has come through is that the finance is A, not available, where it is available, it's unaffordable, 
and perhaps doesn't suit the circumstances of new farmers. So uh, over to you, Mr. Shokun. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Farai. Um, you know, I think uh, a lot has been said uh, on this uh, on this forum. Um, uh, a lot of ideas have been expressed. A lot of questions have been asked. Uh, I think critically, the the important thing is that a conversation is happening. Um, you know, in, in order to to grow our country, our organizations, and ourselves, um, it is critical that we are solutionists in terms of our thinking. Um, it, it's really the only way we're going to uh, be able to improve lives um, as a financial institution uh, and organization, we are committed to uh, speaking to people, our doors are open. Um, uh, you know, we don't turn anyone away. That's, a, that's one of our, uh, our key mantras. Um, and, and we wanna sit and talk to see if, if we can help each other out. Um, and it's, it's important that, you know, we don't leave out these critical things that we're talking about in terms of technology, in terms of government support. If we bring all those things into the conversation, I think uh, there is real power in uh, creating uh, optionality for those who are looking to, to get funding, but most importantly, those who are looking to grow. Um, and, uh, and just to thank everybody who's dialed in today, we do appreciate it. We hope you join us for more of these sessions. Uh, thanks, Farai, I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Matema, for, for those closing remarks. Uh, once again, thank you to everyone who's participated, who's joined, and been part of this webinar. It's uh, brought to you by First Capital Bank, focusing on the agri-business value chain in Zimbabwe, the key opportunities, and how to navigate the challenges. I want to thank our guest, Oana, who had to leave us a little earlier, uh, but certainly I think his presentation really put into context what is available in terms of opportunity, what the challenges are, and what's being done to address them. Honorable Deputy Minister Vangelis Haritatos. I uh, want to thank Mr. Paul Zakaria from Zimbabwe Farmers Union, Kudam Sasiwa from Fresh in a Box, Mr. Tatenda Marume from Zim Trade, uh, and once again, everyone who did participate. Thank you so much for the feedback. Thank you so much for engaging. Uh, follow uh, the various platforms to find out when the next conversation is. We look forward to having you join us. I do believe that this recording or a recording of this program will be available online. Uh, so if you've missed it or didn't get all of it, or if you want to you know, refer it and share it, please do so. Uh, and we encourage you certainly to engage with us if you have any other questions, follow-up questions. Uh, the, the lines are open, the platforms are open, the doors are open. For me, Farai Makutuya, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, to the panel, thank you so much for being a part of this. And uh, we certainly hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Farai. Thank you. Thank you.